All right, Josh Smith here, <laughs> live in my Flat 5 studios. Today's guest is a really close friend of mine, one of my favorite guitar players. I was lucky enough to get to go over to Germany and play with this fantastic band. God, it was probably two years ago already. I don't even, yeah, it was about two years ago. Yep. Um, he's an incredible musician, guitar player, singer. Uh, he's a great engineer as well. He's a great dude. We're fellow Ibanez signature artists now, which is pretty fucking exciting. Yes. Uh, so please welcome everybody, a uh, really good friend and a, an amazing musician, Martin Miller. Thanks for having me, Josh. Good to be here. Good to talk to you. Yeah, likewise, man. Likewise. Yeah. It's been too long with all this COVID since we've got to actually see each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sure it would have been in January if we would have seen each other, at least exactly. the, nor the normal Nam hang. But um Man, so I've been starting all these interviews with everybody, kind of getting a feel for how the guitar ends up in their hands initially. Because, mm -hmm. you know, some people come from musical family, some don't. I, I didn't come from a musical family. It was really a coincidence or just random that a guitar ended up in my life. How did it happen for you? Are you from a musical family? And, and how the guitar show up? My family is musically interested okay. or just, just in generally... In general, very cultivated, but none of them have, have been pro musicians by any stretch of the imagination. My mother sang in church choir. My father can strum a few chords on an acoustic guitar, and, and that's the extent of that. Um, my cousin, for example, is, has a huge record collection. My father had a huge record collection, and so music is an integral part of this family, although I'm the black sheep in that I'm the only one who pers pursued it as a career, right. took it a little more seriously. Yeah. So, so how did the guitar end up in your hands the very first time? Do you remember? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So my, my, the cousin that, that I mentioned previously had uh, an electric guitar and he brought it to our house. And I've always was, was kind of drawn to music that had guitar in it. Not sure if it was because it has guitar in it, but it's just, you know, just music that was very energetic, very expressive, rock music, heavy music, that kind of thing that, that always interested me even when I was young. Um, my first favorite band was the Rolling Stones, for example. It was my first love in music. And yeah, so Cousin comes over, over with the electric guitar and the tiny amplifier and he plugs it into the amplifier and he plays. And it's all cool. It's all smiles. But then he cranks the gain. And that made my, my eyes light up. I, I just, I just, I think I was immediately attracted. Now looking back on this and analyzing it, I was always attracted to compression and distortion, things that sound kind of broken. <laughs> um, I really liked the idea that you can make such a tiny move on the electric guitar, just brush over the strings and have the sound just tear down a house. Um, so that really, that, that experience, um, of that electric guitar going through that amplifier, which was a, a marathon practice amp, but still, it, it stuck with me. And so I wished for my first electric guitar, which I still have. It's a Hondo, and it's such a it's a short scale guitar. It's so horrible that if you hit the strings really hard, they come off the bridge. It, it's, yeah, yeah. It's an atrocity. But um, I didn't have an, a guitar amplifier back then. So what I did, I went to, to my father's, I went through my father's stereo system. And of course, these hi fi systems, they barely have any distortion with it, it yeah. built in, right? They're designed to be as distortion free as possible. And I didn't really know what distortion was. So, but I understood that if I turn the volume all the way up, I can get a little bit of distortion. So I, the first thing I did was destroy my father's stereo, and blew out <laughs> the speakers, literally. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was my first contact with with the guitar. I couldn't really play it or anything. I just, I think I literally just slammed the strings. Was your, did your cousin show you any things? Like, was that the first things you learned? Yeah, a little later down the line, either he or my father showed me how to fret. And then what I did was just literally move the finger up and down the string until I think my parents eventually understood that I might have a legitimate interest in learning the instrument. And they got me some, um, classical guitar lessons because for some reason this is a very german thing i i think is for some reason the belief here is that you should start out with classical guitar first 
until you progress to the electric guitar. I'm not sure why that's the case. It's, I think it's a cultural thing in, in general. I think pretty much every American household somewhere has a, has a Western guitar sitting somewhere, right? A steel string, acoustic. Like in the same yeah. way that in German households, you find classical guitars, nylon strings. Nobody, nobody owns Western steel string guitars for some reason. It's, it's bizarre. Yeah, well, where was I? So yeah, I, they got me into classical lessons, which I hated because it was my music teacher at the time from school. And she, she hated guitar, she hated music, and she hated me. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think that sh really proved how much I was into music because she didn't break me. Right. That's, yeah, I mean, it's funny. That's the kind of thing people don't talk about that often. But, you know, the the first like point of learning that you get the first teacher has a huge impact. So yeah, for you to be able to get through having one that wasn't that supportive and into what you are, it does it shows how much you really wanted to learn to play the guitar and how much yeah, music she, she would sit there, cover her eyes like this and and do the metronome with her fingernails on the on the table like this and she had to teach me after hours she hated it and i hated it we, we hated each other so <laughs> how old were you at this time that was in in so we go to we start in, in germany you go to high school from fifth grade so do grades one to four in elementary and then we then the first grade in high school is the fifth grade that was probably fifth grade in high school um and that lasted for half a year tops, I guess, a year maybe. And then I had a, I had a teacher from, from a bigger city uh, come over to teach some, some people privately uh, in, in the village that I was uh, growing up in. And he went over to our place to teach me. And I finally got myself a proper teacher who was right. also uh, a jazz player. He played classical guitar, jazz guitar, a little bit of rock guitar. He could play saxophone. He could play trumpet. Um, nice. he, he got me into the whole audiation uh, thing, like pre-hearing, ear training. Into the, he, he, he got me some good basics on the way he taught me how to read. Mm. So I, one thing I appreciate now about him that still stuck with me is the fact that his, his approach to teaching was not purely guitar centric was very holistic he really it was really important to him to shape you into a complete musician oh yeah nice and what yeah. at that time like when you're you know your formative moments of learning what music were you listening to was it just whatever your parents listened to in the house or had you already started to form like you know personal preferences and stuff no i i was getting i was getting into all kinds of things. So as I said, I started out with the Rolling Stones. Then I, I, I moved on to, I got into Pink Floyd very early on. I think at age six, probably I started listening to The Wall. <laughs> so reading to that, there's videos of me on my, on my 10th birthday, miming along to Nirvana and stuff like that. I got really into Nirvana. I got into Metallica after. Then I got into more progressive stuff like Dream Theater. Right. And, and then around the time that I entered college, I, uh, the, the world of, of jazz and fusion opened up to me and I got really into that through, through Mike Stern and Pat Metheny. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So when do you start, you know, playing with other musicians? When's the first time those things happen? That was in, in school band. Okay. So I was, I was, I was, I was in school band from, I would say age 13, 14 um, for a couple of years. And I also um, had what we called an impro band that was a part of the conservatory that I went to that the teacher was from. So he got me into impro band where I would start to start to play with, with piano players and, and, and horn players, play jazz standards. And I did uh, gain a little bit of big band experience as well. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite a diverse uh, educational scope that they put me through. It was, it was, I think those, those years were very important. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, even looking back on my limited amount of music in school, cause I was, I was taking lessons from the time I was six till whatever, 13. And by then by 13, I was gigging quite I a know, bit actually. Yeah. But, but even, you know, at the same time I was gigging in high school, I did have jazz band 
and you know theory classes and things like that and i you know i not that i thumb my nose at it at the time but i wasn't like super excited about music at school because i was playing gigs already and i was working but looking back now it's like i that part was fundamental to some of the things that i take for granted now the knowledge mm -hmm. that i have and just the little you know fundamental things and I, obviously that's here in the states that's lacking tremendously now you know there, it's not not even really an option at most schools like it was for me and especially for the generation before me it was just automatic you would have music no matter what you know is it that way in germany still now i mean is it still pretty solid the music in the schools oh the music in school at at the time i was there was horrendous it's quite honestly horrendous there is no, there was no obligations to 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 do music or learn an instrument in any kind of any kind of way. I my I was lucky enough that even though I was growing up in a village and the town was really far, my father used to drive me to conservatory every week to attend these bands and these extra theory courses, and so that was out away from school. Gotcha. And actually, it, school did not support it in any kind of way. They also, the only thing that was happening at school was school band, and that was formed with my Latin teacher. So he was, he was doing, doing extra work after hours and gotcha. uh, put a band together with himself and a few, a few other students. Yeah. So that was, yeah, school was weak as far as, as musical education goes. I have the, the conservatory to thank for that. But you know, you, you were saying you got, you got into that very early yourself and then you started gigging. And I've heard the recordings and you were, you were freaking burning back then. But I have to say about myself, I'm a late bloomer when it comes to, comes to those things. So at age 13, I was nowhere, nowhere near the level that you were at. So hmm. for me, I, I got, I got, I got my, my skills together at a much later point. I think, I think even though music was very important, important to me, it wasn't really until I was 16, 17 that I really started hitting the shed interesting yeah is that kind of when you knew that you know yeah, there's there is a moment when we know like oh yeah. i like playing guitar versus i'm a guitar player like forever mm -hmm. this is it this is what i do is that kind of when that that happened for you the, yeah there were a few pivotal moments around that time the first one was seeing steve morse for the first time nice that was absolutely mind blowing i always say this i've said this numerous times but it was the single-handedly most intense musical experience i've ever had was it his trio or was it dixie dregs it was deep purple oh deep purple all right and cool. so and that was i think it was in 96 97 maybe 98 mm -hmm. somewhere around the time i don't exactly remember but there are still there's recordings from that show on youtube and sometimes i go back to that and have my mind blown and it still hits me still hits me yeah. still yeah. incredible oh dude when day. i was 13 mm -hmm. years old I used to hang out at this club, the Musicians Exchange in Fort Lauderdale, and they would let me like be there when the bands were loading in, sound mm -hmm. check. I would I would just hang around, and so he was playing there with with his trio with Dave Larue and and Lavitz, and um, you know he came in with the tie dye tank top, and then <laughs> set up the giant wall of angles and the classical guitar on the stand and the whole the, the whole thing. And, yeah. But he was so nice. I think yeah. I actually served him and the rest of the band their food, like their pre-show <laughs> food. I used to do whatever I could to just hang around this club. Yeah. But he was so kind. And yeah, it was the same, same thing, like seeing that show. Just like, whoa, I didn't know that was possible, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. I think I, I at the time, I still, I, I only knew Eric Clapton, Santana, and Richie Blackmore. And I still thought Richie Blackmore was going to be the guitar player I'm going to see that night. And <laughs> <laughs> so I was completely ignorant. <laughs> and, and yeah, and then I, I got Steve Morris instead. And yeah, that, 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 that kind of set the bar as to the kind of guitar player I wanted to be. Nice. It's got to be this. Um, yeah. And the other pivotal experience, I think, was when I got into Dream Theater, really, really hardcore, that as, as a teen, that really, it, it just it just changed for me the expectation of what what music can be like, and uh, it inspired me to to pursue music as a as a full time thing. And again, you you you're 
probably from a much more you grew up in a much more musically vibrant place i'm literally from from a village with 500 people there's no that not that there isn't a music scene there's no musicians period right there's nobody and for me to do music uh properly i vowed to my parents that i was going to study music i was going to study guitar and move to the move to the big city and and at least if i'm going to do music at least do it with a degree <laughs> right yeah. right wow well man yeah. i mean that's another thing like you know coming from where you come from and then getting into the music you got into i mean there's just an automatic level of effort that has to be put in if you want to play any of those things you just talked about yeah. it's like there there is absolutely no shortcut to wanting to play dream theater songs or steve morris mm -hmm. things or or whatever and i mean so yeah. you you do either you have a decision of like am i willing to put in this amount of effort and that's what yeah. separates professionals from everybody else. I mean, yeah. we all it's have not even that a question, moment of, though. this is it, you know? Yeah. But it's not even a question. You, you, once you You're get right. into it, once, once you, you got a taste for it, it's yeah. over. You're, it puts your life in a different direction. Because you've got to dedicate your life to it if you want to be able to play that kind of music. Yep. yep. you got to put oh. the hours in, period. Wow. So, okay, so... You get into that that stuff. You start working even harder. You're you know high school age and college age. Um, when when do like gigs start becoming a thing? That was in college. Yeah. When you would do when you would start teaching a little bit during the week, play a gig on the weekend. That was throughout high school. Uh, sorry, throughout music college, and it was after music college as well. Um that I, I would just play function gigs. I, I, I did have a band of my own, but we never amounted to anything. So it was really just function gigs, most of which require reading and not really the kind of music I wanted to do. And I saw myself going down a, a road that I wasn't too happy with, uh, where you can get, get into this kind of flow of teaching during the week, function gig on the weekend. And I thought to myself, is this what I want to do? throughout my entire life. And I, I got especially depressed after college, after a, a schedule was taken away from me. My life was scheduled, right? But it was taken yeah. away from me. And I was procrastinating for half a year and then decided to do something about it. Bought myself a camera and started making YouTube videos. I just yeah. wanted to put myself out there for who I am, not for somebody interchangeable. Mm -hmm. As who, which is what you are in function gigs. Well, it's interesting to me because I, I would say, you know, I'm older than you, so we're slightly a different generation. So your first thought was more towards your own thing right away, yeah. whatever that is, which is an interesting thing. I mean, so I went backwards. I was only doing my own thing pretty much as a kid. Mm -hmm. But I never made any money. Not that I, not, not true. I did make money, but I had no responsibilities. You know, I was a child. Um, so when I had responsibilities and I started to grow up, I needed to make like actual, make a living money, like pay bills money. And that's when I decided to do basically function gigs, like you're saying, but on a, oh yeah, on a different level, you know, touring as a guitar player with different pop acts and doing sessions and things like that. But to me, it was a shift of, okay, my own thing, not my own thing. You know what I mean? Just guitar mm -hmm. player versus Josh Smith artist or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, it's interesting to me that you're, you initially knew you didn't want to do that. It's, period. I think I wanted, I, if the, the type of gigs that you had played, I think I w w was going to be okay with those, but my location that I was in, which was Dresden right. at the time, they, it wouldn't allow for it. You, you moved to LA yeah. and you put yourself out there into that scene and there are all those opportunities and where I am from, those opportunities don't exist. So in a lot of ways, and I still live very close to home these days. Yeah. So I was born in East Germany behind the wall and I still live in, in Saxony in East Germany these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm somebody who never really moves too far from, move too far from where they were born. So my, I have much, much less career opportunities outside of the opportunities that I create for myself. Right. So most of what I do these days are opportunities that I 
create for myself, such as my YouTube channel, um, my session band, the instructional products I, I make, the, the record I produce, etc. Yeah, those are the, those things are self-made, and it's kind of because I had no other choice because there were no other opportunities for me. Yeah, which is an incredibly difficult path to walk, mm -hmm. but also incredibly rewarding, you know, and frustrating. Yeah, but sometimes I, I feel like I lack. I, I sometimes a small part of me sometimes wishes that I would have experienced that professional musician touring life, um, like playing for for a big pop act. I have friends who do that, such as you, or did that. Um, and I kind of envy them a little bit for that experience because I do not have that experience. Looking back on it now, in the midst of it, I was, what's the best way to put this? I enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. It was nice to, you know, tour on a, on a level that was plusher, you know, in a bus and nice hotels and, you know, those type of gigs, like it's fun to play in front of a lot of people, do those type of things. But I was always missing improvising, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And being mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Um, but looking back on it more now, the thing that stands out to me is how much better it made me at being me, doing all those gigs that required me to build up a set of skills that would yeah. have never been necessary had I yeah. not done that period of time. And those skills have made my thing better. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what I'm, I'm most grateful for that period of time. Yeah. yeah, for example, my drummer, Felix, he's he's a guy like that. He still does it to this date and he loves it. It's a choice for him to be touring for somebody else constantly. That's that's He's done that since he was 17. Yeah. I think he even dropped out of school early because he, got, he scored a gig with a number one billboard German act yeah. and he has not stopped since. Yeah. And that's just his, his life. And sometimes I wish I experienced at least a little bit of that you know I, I did tour but with with such small acts where it's still uh like a, like a yeah like a gorilla type thing yeah interesting man yeah well okay so once you start kind of finding your place in the world you know mm -hmm. and making your videos promoting yourself finding this kind of lane how how difficult you know, do you find it to, to kind of come up with ways to, you know, you're, we're, we're constantly promoting ourselves, which is a weird thing to be doing, you yeah. know, and we, but we always have to be thinking about like, what's the next move? What's the next way that I promote myself? Um, does that, I mean, does it drain you sometimes? It, I know it drains me. Yeah. It's, it's not what I'm put on earth for, for sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, I, I would like to eventually be able to just afford somebody to do those things for me <laughs> but you know that never happens <laughs> yeah um, yeah that's that's the part for me that feels like work like yeah. going to, what other people do in their free time going to, to instagram and post a picture of my new guitar that that to me feels like work because that's not something i would do naturally it is a hundred percent work and it's something that people from the outside can't relate to not only can people, regular people who work nine to five jobs can't relate to what we do anyways most of the time, but other musicians who are, you know, not professionals or maybe lower professionals as far as what they do, play less gigs, you know, you know, the, the normal average working musician who plays a couple times a week and has a day job or something yeah. like that, you know, there's this perception and trust me, I know you get it because I get it literally 10 times a day from people asking me advice, how they get to my level, you know, yeah. like, oh, we have signature guitars and, you know, we have a lot of followers and people love what we do. And they think that equates to we're millionaires, you know, and I'm, <laughs> kill I'm killing it. I'm producing records with Joe Bonamassa all the time, which I am. And yes, he's a millionaire, but no, I'm not. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and I don't think it's it's easy for people to get the wrong idea of what, no. what level we are actually at, you know, yeah, because I, I of live a very life. normal average life and lifestyle. Yeah. But <laughs> exactly. I'm actually proud. I'm proud that I, I, the only thing I do is be a self-employed musician and I choose everything I do. I'm my own boss and I still manage to make a living from that. And yeah. that I'm very proud of, to be honest, because I, I, I don't do things that I don't want to do. 
I literally only do stuff that I like. And that, that is a, that is a huge accomplishment for me. And yeah. I, it, I don't, I, I don't, I don't need to have crazy amounts of money, but I need to, what I really need to be doing is make a living with things that, that my heart desires. That is, that right. is the goal for me really. Yeah. Which is a noble goal. <laughs> yeah. Not too much to ask, quite honestly. <laughs> I mean, every, I mean, people with nine to five jobs, they have to get out every morning and drag themselves to the office. And I respect, I respect that. Yeah, absolutely. The fact that they get that they can make themselves do that and do it with a smile. That's yeah. I mean, that's something I've I've, you know, the conversations I've had with my friends over life who are, you know, who work jobs. Not that not that all people don't enjoy their jobs. A lot of no, people no. enjoy their day jobs, yeah. but a lot don't. We all know people who their job doesn't. Those were the ones them. I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that it's just their job. And then they go home and the things they do outside their job are more what they are as a person, you know, and so they can't relate to it. Like literally everything we do is, is our job. Everything there's about a, us as a person is our there's job. There's a saying in German that goes, uh, work time is lifetime. And I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. So I don't, I, I don't make really much of a distinction between my work time and my off time because my work feels like off time. I mean, my work right now is to sit here and, and talk to you. Yeah. And that's my job. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Fantastic. Very privileged. Yeah. Absolutely. But, privileged. Yes. But you also, ha I had to make a lot of sacrifices to get to that point. No. And you're busting your ass just to mm -hmm. make enough. I mean, you know, to cover your, your, your ass to, to pay your bills. I mean, we have to be yeah. so incredibly diverse. We have to do all these things like like what we're doing right now, talking to each other and making our own content and yeah. promoting gear that we're associated with and creating instructional material. And mm -hmm. oh yeah, maybe releasing actual music sometimes. You know, and well, things that, like that's that. The, that's the kind of thing, that's a vanity project that you spent money on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I spent my, I earn money so I can afford to make music. Ex yeah. There you go. There you go. Exactly. Well, if, if that doesn't tell you how much we love to actually play music, then nothing does. It's like I realized through this pandemic that the amount of my income that comes from actual gig money really is nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, most of my money comes from all these other places that when I go out on the road, I break even at best. It's a labor of love. You know, yeah, yeah I've that's been made crystal clear to me. Now that well, it's been yeah, taken yeah. away, you and know, that, that's, I can't think that's where we are a little wired a little differently. Cause I think if, if you could choose to do one thing, it would be touring with your, with your band. A hundred percent. And if I had to pick one thing out of all the things I do that I like the most, as of now, it would be probably making records, my own records. That would be, pro that, that's the thing where I think. I think you find yourself you find that you can express yourself on stage best. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think I can express myself best through the music I create, which, which sounds kind of funny because I'm not known for the music I create primarily, but that's because the music I'm working on right now hasn't been released yet. Right. But to me, that's the lane I want to go down is in the future is it's really the, my original music. Nice. Well, speaking of that original mm -hmm. music, you, you've talked about it for a while, you know, that you're close to done. Yeah. When are people going to hear this, this stuff, man? Cause I know people I hope this want summer, it. this summer, this summer, that would be it's, great. It's finally going to happen. Yeah. I just need to, you know, things are a bit, bit tricky with the situation in the world. I, I need to get my band together, shoot a video, a yeah. uh, music video or two. And yeah, the, the, as far as, as, as the progress of the album goes, like, the music is 100% written. The instruments are 100% recorded. It is 98% mixed. The lyrics are 100% written and there's a few vocal overdubs that I, I need to be doing because it's funny. At th so I learned to sing for this record. My right. initial idea was I'm going to learn to sing. That, that was five years ago. And then I'm going to make a vocal record. And this is the, the record. And my vocals have changed so much over the past three years that, uh, or even the last year that I, I keep re-recording things because, oh, I don't sing like that anymore. I need to, I need yeah. to, 
do that again. And so I get into this loop of, of never putting out the record because I keep tweaking on it. But yeah, it's very close. I, I think another two to three months and it should see the light of the day. That's exciting, man. I'm looking forward to, to hearing yeah. it. Nice. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into the 10 questions. Yes. Take a right, sip here. Number one, when you started playing and learning, do you remember the first, you know, lick, phrase, song that when you figured it out, it like locked in forever? This is the coolest thing. Like that moment when you finally figure out something you've listened to a bunch and it comes out correctly and there's no turning back after that. Do you remember a moment like that? I think one of the first things I learned was the guitar riff to Satisfaction by the Stones. Yeah. Using the open G string. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this sounds just like the record. Wow. Which just that state that this sounds just like the record. The, the first time you do anything like that, mm -hmm. it is. It's this moment of just like, I can't believe I did that. Yeah. It's know? like the instrument is doing that. Not me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Crazy. It's an amazing feeling. And yeah. yeah, there really is. There's no going back. Mm -hmm. after that feeling not for me there wasn't you know yeah i remember like the first time after i learned the pentatonic scale and was able to play a little bit and and then was finally able to like whatever piece of music came on the radio oh my god i could find the key and just start going it's like when, uh, when my teacher showed me the 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 minor pentatonic box it was game over i was like yeah. i can play anything now all these notes fit always yeah. And of course, and the way it was taught to me, which is horrible, but it was taught to me in, the, in a way that if you're in a minor key, put it on the root note. If you're, if you're in a major key, play the same nonsense, but th <laughs> three frets down, <laughs> which yeah. is like the literal opposite of what I teach nowadays and what I stand yeah. for. But that's how it started out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Man, that's funny. Yeah. Ugh. Those were the it days. Is, Innocent. It's like a magic so, trick. It was so innocent back then because you, you, you got this shape and all of a sudden you thought, oh, this is the secret that I was chasing. Now I got it. It's a hundred percent. It's like a magic trick. Yeah. Like this. I can't. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. Number two. Do you remember the first solo you ever learned note for note? Oh, I was not the guy who learned solos note for note. I think in my school band days, I improvised everything. Mm. And it was, but that because I was so good at it, I was too lazy to learn solos note for note. It was not, it was un, not until college years that I, when I was forced to learn solos note for note. Mm. And I learned a bunch, I learned a bunch note for note. For example, <laughs> one of the early ones in college, I think, was the Frank and Bali Ionian solo from Modes No More Mystery. Right. Yeah. And I learned, I learned. Yeah, a bunch of Mike Stern stuff, a bunch of Matheny stuff. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Mine was ACDC. <laughs> yeah, but I was already in my 20s when I learned my first solo note for a note. <laughs> That's funny. And nowadays I, nowadays, I recommend people learn solos note for note. By all means, do it. See, I, I, wasn't, I didn't learn a ton note for note, but I would always learn like the intro of the solo. And yeah. then I would kind of go my own way after that. But I, I've always been really fascinated with the way people start solos. Because I feel like yeah. whatever you play first, the rest of it just kind of like unfolds itself like magic afterwards based on what you play first. At least it just, the it just kind of takes care of itself, you know? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I kind of did that. There is a, there, there is a, like a, you remember mini disc recorders? Yeah. I, I still have a recording somewhere from a gig when I was 17, 18. And I, yeah, I think 17. And I just, at the time, was watching the John Petrucci and Paul Gilbert uh, instructional videos. And it was, it's like that, they're fantastic videos, of course, but it's like when you're growing your hair out, there's that phase in between where everything's yeah. just a mess. Yeah. Where I had to, and I started, I started to be able to pick really fast. And, Every solo I played on that on on, on, that, on that one show that I that I have a recording of is speed picking start to finish at insane tempos, at insane tempos. Like I listen to that, and I think, 
how the heck did I do that? I have no idea. And I'm even playing playing some Steve Moore stuff, like the the the, the arpeggios from Cascades, full speed, flawlessly. It's like, how did that happen? But yeah, but every solo was like start to finish, thirty second notes. It was awful. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> oh man. All right, number three. What's the first thing you play whenever you pick up a guitar? Do your hands just automatically go somewhere? Either an open A sus chord with a with a with an open E, a G, and then A sus. Ba -ba -ba. That's a good one. Uh, or some Mike Stern stuff in C minor. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I love my C minor. What about like if you're picking up a guitar you've never played before and you just want to see, you know, what it has, how it feels, if it would work for you. Do you have like a specific thing you do to kind of check it out? I'll probably arpeggiate some open chords with hybrid picking or something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do the, the, do the, do the riff from Hotwired. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> one. Some double stops, something like that. Nice. Nice. What, what's your choice? Um, well, if I'm if I'm trying out guitars, the first thing I do is just this, and see I just put my arm on it to see if it rings at all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'll normally do that before I even pick it up, just on the wall. I'll just strum it and touch the body, and if it rings, if I feel it vibrating, then I'll pick it up and I'll feel the neck and see, you know, oh, okay, the neck's okay. Then I'll play. I think um, I, I'll probably play some of those wide widespread triads in a couple in verse and see how it intonates. Yeah, I'll do the same. I'll. I'll mostly check intonation, so I'll I'll just run inversions of chords up the neck yeah. just to see if the tuning is cool. Check the fret. I always do this and check try that the on this work. guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> I but I, I rub my hand up and down both sides of the fretboard yeah. to check the fret ends and see if mm -hmm. they're sharp. All that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I love my open chords when there's when there's some distortion. I love a good good old fashioned open. E uh, open open E chord without a third, yeah, G chord open without a third. Yeah, yeah. That 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 still gives me that still reminds me of why I picked up the electric guitar. I think. Yeah, when you hit an A power chord, second yeah. fret. I mean, it just sounds like the guitar. It's a lifestyle. Know? It sounds like yeah. a lifestyle. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, number four. What key style song groove whatever do you kind of hear when you're not playing? Like when you're just driving around or you're cooking or you're doing something, do you have anything that always just kind of lives as like a soundtrack? Because I, I hear a, a swing all the time or a shuffle. Yeah, probably a shuffle. That kind of tempo. And then hear Mike Stern go, wee wee. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah. That's yeah, probably see, the I, thing I'm drawn to. Yeah. It's not that dissimilar from what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm hearing more like Charlie Parker type stuff most of the time, either over a shuffle or just a fast swing. And yeah, I, I normally, the improv part of it, the single note improv, I'll have to like finish phrases in my head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Before I can let it go. Especially when I'm going to bed. It always feels like when I'm laying down to bed and turn the lights off, I'm I'm soloing in my head yeah, and I have to finish 100%. it. I think yeah. this is this is something that that a lot of people underestimate is the, the connection of the the sound and the imagination with the fingers with the fretboard. And even if I don't practice guitar on a on a on a certain day, I I still do because those thoughts are running through these ideas are running through my head and I I express I, for example, I don't have perfect pitch, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I do dream of playing guitar. And when I wake up and, and check, I, I play in the, it sounds in the correct key that I'm playing in. See, that's really interesting because... And I can always hear the E. Duh. I, can, I can imagine myself go to a guitar and go, and hit the E. See if it's right. See, what's funny yep, is in, right. in your dream, <laughs> I don't even know if it matters whatever key you play it in when you pick up the guitar is the right key. You yeah. know what I mean? Because you, you don't know. But, uh, man, I know, like, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, the three minutes when I know I'm going to play guitar, but I haven't picked it up yet, 
you know that you know when you're walking out to the studio or when you're you put your case down you unzip it you you know you're about to start playing inevitably something pops in my head that's going to be the first thing mm -hmm. i play and it always comes out like exactly like right now I'm hearing did it and did it and do 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 the edit but do 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 it and did it and did it that will inevitably be the first thing I play if I pick up the guitar you know what I mean because I hear it clear as day yeah. it's amazing how that happens yeah. I, I think that's 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 really what what separates the men from the boys is when when the the playing happens in your in your mind first and and through conscious decisions you make the sound happen. Yeah. You make it happen because you intend to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fast. It's, it's really interesting yeah. to me. I like this stuff. I think about it a lot. Like why, how I've ended up where I'm at and, and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, how we move forward, all that stuff, but cool. All right. Number five, when along your process, did you start to feel, or your journey, did you start to feel like, you were finding a, a personal voice as an improv player, as a guitarist. You know, when, when did you start to feel like maybe you found something that was yours? Yeah. And maybe you should go further that way, you know? So, sir, I can tell you when it, when it was the case in the least, and that was in college. Mm. Because in, in college, you have to play, you know, in a fusion ensemble, in a rock ensemble, you have to do big band, you have to do this and that and the other and you kind of have to be a chameleon in each and one of, every one of those cases for example when i when i hit the mike stern phase really hard all i wanted to do is play with a stereo rig and chorus of course but then i had to go to big ben and and play play a semi hollow uh through a through a fender amp and strum quarter notes so and then at, at the same time, we had a, we had a, an extremely active scene of incredible acoustic guitar players at the college. That, that's kind of what the, the college is known for Europe wide is for okay. the incredible amount of highest level virtuoso acoustic guitar players. So there, there were, there were guys who could play flamenco to, to the, high, the highest level classical to the highest level percussive Tommy Emmanuel style everything at to the highest level and i would see these guys and i would think to myself well i, I want to be able to do that and then i start start working on those types of things but they really take me away from what my initial target was and the thing is in college i think in order to be accepted by the group you kind of tend to want to blend in a little bit sure and i kind of denied what, what my roots were and i really got got far away of what i initially wanted to sound like and as soon as I left college, I think I was, I was, it was freeing me up from those expectations and from the peer pressure. And I slowly started developing that, that, that sound that I'm, that I'm using now. And yeah, and I allowed myself to, to, to say goodbye to a lot of things that I can't do and will never be able to do and be okay with it. Yeah. Or actually embrace that as part of part of me. Part of me is also what I can do, not just what I can do. And I've, I've, I've matured to the point where I'm happy to not be able to do most it's, of the things. It's really important to be... There's a big difference between contentment and laziness. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If, if there's stuff that you don't care about, you know you don't care about, then it, that's fine. You know, to uh, like I've said before, I'll never play like Ingve, and I'm a hundred percent fine with that. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, no problem. You know, if I wanted to do that, I probably could have done it if I put in the work because I know yeah. my track record. I can play. If I would have worked hard enough to do it, I would have done it. So it obviously Surely. wasn't that important to me. Um, versus the things that are important to me, but then I don't put in the time that's laziness. And you mm -hmm. don't, you don't, you know, you don't, you can't blame anybody but yourself for that. And we all cross those barriers, but yeah, yeah. I think it's kind of, there was a, there was an interview I saw of Brian Beller with Yannick Wisdala. And he said that what you do musically, you have to be able to, to boil down to 10 words, or it's kind of like the elevator pitch thing where you have to mm -hmm. be able to describe your business to somebody within one elevator ride. And right. I think, and I think I've, 
in my late twenties, I've really boiled it down to like John Petrucci with a jazz degree or something like that. That's kind of my, my, my stick. Interesting. Yeah. That's a good, that's, I'm going to put that in the description of this video. You know, this week, <laughs> yes, is John Petrucci with a jazz degree. If John Petrucci hadn't dropped out of Berkeley. Exactly. <laughs> and continued to play Ibanez guitars. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. All right. Number six. What do you consider your biggest weakness as a guitar player? Oh, so many. Uh, that is not, that, that is being honest. I, there's so many things I, I can do, but let's say there's a lot of things I can do that I don't consider a weakness because they're not part of what I do, but from right. within what I do that I should possibly be better at, I think I'm, I'm rushing a little. Oftentimes, that is something that really annoys me. I don't like my inconsistencies. Um, like I can play this, like when we do takes with a band, take four will be wildly better than take one. I wish I could get to take four level on the first take, but I can't. <laughs> so more, more consistently, I, I wish I would need less warm up. My left hand is very weak. I have weak hands. I need a ton of warm up for the left hand. I wish I could just grab the guitar and be at a hundred percent. I'll stick with that. That's an interesting one because, you know, let's just say on a normal average day when you don't have a session with the guys or you, you know, when you're just at home, you know, maybe you're working on content, maybe you're not. How much are you playing when you don't have just some specific task to do? That is, that varies greatly. Um, because first of all, most days I teach, so I'll take the guitar as one of the first things of the day, inevitably. Yeah, so that's okay. one or two hours of being on the guitar, thinking about the guitar, doing something with the guitar. Um, these days I'm mostly, I'm mostly playing guitar with a specific goal in mind. Mm. Um, so it is either to do some studio work, record one of my songs or write something or work on an instructional product. It, it's usually tied to some kind of, to some kind of business related thing, or it's to some, some specific goal, some specific right. target. But like the other day I got this beautiful Ibanez custom shop and I just spent three days of just picking up the guitar and playing it and exploring it for, just for the sake of it. So it can vary. It can be literally anything from zero hours to the entire day spent on the guitar. Yeah. It varies greatly, but these days I think I'm, I'm seeing myself or I'm becoming more of a less of, of a pure guitar player. I'm, I'm trying to become a bit more develop a bigger range with what I, with what I do. So I spend a lot of time engineering stuff. I, I I, I to, as I told you before we hit record, I'm, I'm learning piano at the moment. Mm. I'm doing my vocal exercises. Um, I do music all day. It may not just be me sitting down with a guitar and practicing. I, yeah. Yeah. I've, I'm finding, you know, that I've probably played guitar less than ever this year. Me too. You know, a lot of that of course is because of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, but also that meant a lot of my work this year. I, I produced a lot of records this year. Mm -hmm. And while I play on those, I don't play as much as I, I would in a normal scenario. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? So I'm mostly engineering, talking, writing charts, arranging, you know, doing production work. But I think that's great because that, that makes you a better musician overall. Oh, a hundred percent. But, but, you know, normally the thing you just said about not wanting to warm up, that's one thing I've had most of my life of, I'm just, I'm, I'm always warm because I play so much mm -hmm. and the heavy strings and the strength oh, yeah. in my hand, I'm used to just, it doesn't matter. I could pick up a guitar anytime and I'm, I'm in, you know, it's not a hundred percent that way right now because I'm not playing as much in, mm -hmm. and I'm not playing as much in those scenarios where the muscle is as strong as I'm used to. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that, that, that is definitely something I, Dude, I was relate to, but I was it's, in it's, that, yeah, it's the same with me. I spend way too much time on the computer. Like when I, when I, when I do my record, you would think, oh, he must be playing guitar all day when no, 
because I wrote those tunes, I recorded the guitars. I'm very quick with recording guitars because that's my main instrument. I, yeah. I put the guitars down in, in an hour and then that's it. And then I never touch the guitar again. The rest is, is tweaking, arranging, mixing, vocals, um, uh, driving down to Austria to record drums with my, with my drummer. And it's everything but guitar. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Man, I was in Nashville last week producing a record and so i played you know guitar on every song rhythm guitar it's not my record uh you know i'm just producing and there was a song that was like like you know kind of house rocking chuck berry you know where you're playing and that's so much fun af after four takes of that my hand literally hurt which never happens ever uh -huh. but when you're stretching playing that sixth all the time you know what i you mean can, you can thank god that there's not an f <laughs> <laughs> well yeah exactly <laughs> but it was like and i couldn't believe at the end of the day like man my hand is kind of sore like just because man this year is just unlike any other you know like yeah it's, just weird. for me it's with the piano like i got tiny hands yeah. and the other day i was practicing a 13th uh, sorry 10th on the piano not 13th 10th in one hand so my left hand was playing tense and i was improvising some some lines on top of it and i had to stop for a couple of days because man my hand was absolutely absolutely burning it's yeah it's not as heavily in use as it usually is yeah 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 it's weird uh all right number seven who's a huge influence on your guitar playing that maybe people would be surprised to hear oh huh I don't think I don't think there's a big is there a big surprise there? I've always been pretty open about who I listen to. Did, what what would be your answer? Maybe that gets me thinking in the right direction. Um, my biggest answer is like singers, like Sam Cooke, okay, Aretha yeah. Franklin. They're a huge influence on the way that I play guitar. So I don't know if it's a giant surprise because obviously I love their music and I've mentioned them many mm -hmm. times, but they are a big part of the way I phrase in my soloing. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's, I think for, for me, the, the, from the non-guitar players, some, some of the big influences were Michael Brecker for sure. Yeah. But the intensity of that, of, of that playing is just wow, mind blowing. Uh, Chick Corea was a big one. Yeah. Uh, compositionally too. But uh, composi I, I draw a lot of influence from um, romantic classical music. Mm. Like two of my favorite composers are are uh, Franz Liszt and Frédéric Chopin. Yeah. Okay. I also, I also, I'm a big fan of um, Stravinsky, um, Ravel, that type of music. Nice. And one of my favorite, uh, I also love video game music. That is, that is a big influence. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, Okay, number eight. I'm curious on your answer to this. Oh, my God. Would you rather have a good guitar and a bad amp or vice versa? A great amp and a shitty guitar? I think that depends. I, I would in say... A gig, in a gig, like you're in at a gig. gig I think it depends play. on the sound you're going for. I think my, my, my theory is that with clean tones, the guitar matters more than the amp. And with gainy tones, the amp matters more than the guitar. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. I think there are certain sounds that are amp sounds and there are sounds that are guitar sounds. Sure. So, so if I were to go for a sound like yourself, I think I would, I would pick the guitar. For what I do, I would probably pick the amp. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And I think, I, think, I think from what I saw on your channel, most people would pick the amp, right? Yeah, I would pick the amp 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah my answer is amp as well yeah interesting it's it's, it's bizarre isn't it and you know what yeah. with 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 gain tones i found with with distortion what matters even more than the amp is possibly the speaker and the cap and well i think the most fascinating thing is we are guitar players mm -hmm. but for us to be the most comfortable in a gig situation it's not the comfort of our hands Although yep. that's very important yeah. that we can actually physically play. It's the tone that comes out. 
if the tone yeah. comes out is so terrible or uninspiring or un what we want to hear, it's going to make us have a terrible gig. Play terrible. There has, yeah, there has to be the, the correct balance of what you put in versus what comes out. Yeah. That, that's got to match somehow. Otherwise, you, if, if that is off balance somehow, then playing goes to waste. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. If I have a guitar set up perfectly that plays like a dream, and I yeah. get to the gig and have to plug it into this solid state, whatever, and the sound that comes out sounds like bumblebees, I'm going to have a terrible gig. It doesn't matter how f easily I could pull off. Yeah, it, it could be I a agree. magical guitar that lets me pull off anything possible. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter if I have to play through that thing that sounds like shit. I'm going to have a horrible yeah. gig. And so the people who are watching the gig are going to not enjoy it. You know? Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. The, ultimately, my answer would have to be amp. Even though I, I, I flat that answer a little bit, it, it would have to be amp. Yeah. All right. All right. Number nine. What keeps you motivated to improve as a guitar player? As you're, you know, you're always, we're all, you know, what's, what's the best way to put this? We're pretty accomplished musicians. We worked hard to at least reach the level we've reached. Um, we're sufficient in, in amount of some amount of skill to be able to do what we need to do. You know, and we know, we all know a lot of guys who maybe reach a level of contentment and stop growing. You know, yeah. and that's an obsession that I have to never let that happen. I know. You know? Yeah, we've talked about this. You, yeah. What What keeps you motivated to work on new things and to become be, get better? Yeah. Um, I think around around 2014, 15, I lost a bit of my mojo, and it was. Things were getting a little stale and I was not not too happy about how some things were handled in music and in the online community and I got a bit frustrated with myself and I felt like I was lacking a perspective. What really, really got me motivated again, it was two things. First, learning how to sing was a big one because I kind of, it rejuvenated my guitar playing as well because it, it yeah. reignited my love for music. And the other thing was, was uh, founding my band. I'm working with my band. I think, I think the the, I was lacking the exchange of, of energy with, people in the same room. Yeah, I think that that's that's a big driving driving factor for me. Just play music with other people and also with my guests, such as yourself. I don't want to make a fool out of myself, so I better put put in the put in the work. Um, that that goes very easily for me. And in general, um, nowadays I. How do I put this? Um, it's important to me to, to progress on the guitar, but more importantly, it is to, for me to progress as a musician, which is why, as I mentioned earlier, I do my vocal exercises, I do practice piano, I do engineering. For me, it's kind of starting to mold a little bit into the same thing. I don't see them as such discrete things anymore. I just want to be a better musician every day. And whether I achieve that through developing better ears for, for resonant frequencies or or learning to put my finger down on the piano or learning how to arrange a French horn. Um, yep. It all is part of the same, same thing that becomes my musical sensibility. I, I, you know, I'm a hundred percent with you on there. The more I do every year, not just a hundred percent related to mm -hmm. what, what comes out of this thing, the more I blur the lines between you know what what makes me me it's all me you know the produ producing a record and it, this year has, has taught me that a lot too because so much of in the past my self-worth and and you know oh, yeah. positivity is tied to getting to play this as much as possible and yeah. it, it wasn't the case this year but i was still able to at least be creative and do things and and you know yeah that they make you a better i feel like all that stuff i do ends up making me better here anyway absolutely you know I mean? it's it's a it's a feedback loop almost yeah. and it you you mentioned self-worth and i think i got really down a lot of times like if you, you turn on instagram and you can see uh 10 15 year olds from from uh, god knows where on on earth that can play circles around you and and i i i don't like to attach my self-worth 
solely to that because if I become a more complete musician, I can, I can always say to myself, yes, but there's more to me than just that. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think I've, I've really found myself like with this new record, unfortunately it's not out yet. So it's a, a kind of, kind of talking into the void a little bit, but for me, that record has been out for three years because that's how long I've been working on it. Um, that record really represents that change in me that I, I just want to make really good, good, meaningful music. I think that, that, that's what gets me, gets me up every day. It gets me going and mm -hmm. keeps me motivated. And a big part of that is playing the guitar, but yeah. I, I, I want to serve my own music really. Yeah. Well, that leads us into the 10th question, which yes. is, do you have a five-year plan? You know, are you a guy who likes to plan things out? And have specific goals that you want to reach or more are you you know going with the flow and letting things happen are there really specific places you want to get right now there's dreams i have of course but i i'm a very much a flow driven guy like i would have never thought i was going to start to sing and then i just started to sing and through that i started to write original music and through and and also through the singing i started forming my own band and that kind of blew up on YouTube. That was not planned for, it just happened. And so I did that. And so I'm always just just trying to ride the waves a little bit. Um, what's important, I, I, for me, it's not so really so important to have like a, a grand master plan. What's really important for me is, I th think that you're moving forward. Yep. As long as you're moving forward, you'll go somewhere. <laughs> so uh, I don't have a big five-year plan. I would, I. I I, however, there's some people I take inspiration from as to who they are. Um, one of the, these people, for example, is Stephen Wilson. Stephen Wilson to me is, is like a threefold guy. He's a producer slash writer. He's a guitar player and he's a singer. And I would say in the case of Stephen Wilson, he's one third writer, producer, one third guitar player, one third singer. And I think in my case, I, I, I see that a similar trifold, but for me, the priorities might be one third singer. Um, no, now I'm, now I'm messing this up. I'm probably, probably uh, for me, the, let's say the priority is more shifted towards the guitar than it is towards singing, for example. So I'm leaning more towards that. My priorities are more uh, towards the guitar maybe than they are towards singing. Um, but the, yeah, Stephen Wilson is a person I take uh, inspiration from. Also, I, I like John Petrucci uh, for for how he is. He, yes, he's a guitar player, but he's not the kind of guy who goes on Instagram and does guitar content and stuff like that because his purpose on earth is to be the guitar player for Dream Theater. And I, I find that very inspiring that somebody f founded a band like that and puts everything towards that. Yeah. And I, I think it's, he's, he's more, it's, it's more than, he's, it's, it's bigger than life in a way. I find that very inspiring. Yeah. So in, in, in the same way, I would like, like to treat my own music in the future if, if it, it finds enough recognition to be sustainable, of course. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> We reached the end of the 10 questions. So that's, yeah. uh, dude, thank you for doing this. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks for having me, man. And of course, of we'll, course. we'll do some more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for the rulers, um, stick around. There's going to be turn two with Martin, but if you are not a ruler, you should become one, or at least please subscribe to the channel by hitting the subscribe button. But we'd love you to sign up and become a ruler uh, and you'll get extra videos like one with Martin and, and one with all of my guests on Live from Flat 5. So um, rulers, we'll be right back, and everybody else, we'll see you later. <laughs>